So, why have we all been creaming our jeans for Heartstopper so much? Part one, can you tell I've been watching a lot of YA romance TV? Heartstopper is a lovely little 2022 Netflix series that chronicles the romance between Charlie, the most anxious gay teenager you have ever met, and Nick, the dreamiest closeted bisexual jock you have ever met, as they attempt to navigate their feelings for each other in the absolute nightmare environment that is an all-boys school. Meanwhile, we also witness the adventures of Nick and Charlie's group of friends. Elle, a trans girl who is having trouble making friends at her new all-girls school. Tao, who is, um, Oh, uh, put a pin in town. And Tara and Darcy, Elle's classmates, who are also dealing with the repercussions of coming out publicly as a queer couple. And then there's Isaac, of course, but honestly, he doesn't really do much other than, like, read books in strange places, roll his eyes a bunch, and just kind of mind his own business. And honestly, he's iconic for it. Also, they're all English, but we don't hold that against them. Now, much of the discourse around Heartstopper is specifically about how uplifting and heartwarming it is to to watch, as well as its specific place in the history of queer representation in media. One talking point I see out and about, and something that the cast often brings up in interviews, is that there is a lot of queer media, specifically queer media for adults, that focuses a lot on our trauma and how difficult and painful it can be to be queer in a bigoted world. And while acknowledging that suffering is certainly important, there is not nearly enough media that celebrates the joy of queerness that tells an inspiring and affecting love story with a happy ending. And while I agree with this, I don't think it completely accounts for what makes Heartstopper feel so unique, or why it struck such a resonant pop culture chord with us. After all, it's not as if it's the only teen-focused, romantical, comedical, TV show to come out in recent years with a similar uplifting slash inspirational tone. One might even say that we're in a veritable glut of them and that I have watched them all! Never have I ever. Love Victor, sex education, the sex lives of college girls, even, arguably, the summer I turned pro... <clears throat> sorry, um... <clears throat> sorry, uh, the summer I turned... <clears throat> The summer I turned pretty. Fuck. I need a Tums. These shows all feature a lovable cast of teen characters, often queer teen characters, falling in love, dating, not dating, handling friend group drama, and otherwise struggling to navigate that thorny interstitial span betwixt adolescence and adulthood with wildly varying degrees of success. But Heartstopper feels different. It feels more pleasant and wholesome and lovely than any of those other shows. And it does this while covering some pretty dark subject matter. There are content warnings for this show. And if you're a fan of the comic the show is based on, you know that there's some darker shit coming down the pipe. Heartstopper skews positive, certainly, but it never shies away from showing the depressing, homophobic hellscape of modern life. So? Mirror, mirror on the wall, why is Heartstopper the most wholesome of all? Well, I have seen some theories floating around the good old internet, but they're all wrong and I'm right and here's why and I'll tell you. All those other shows drive their conflicts through miscommunication. Heartstopper drives its conflict through honesty. You want I should give you examples? I think they want some examples, Piers. Okay. Let's give him some examples. Troy, drop a beat. Sex education. Otis leaves Maeve a voicemail telling her he has feelings for her. Voicemail gets deleted, and then they miscommunicate about it for all of season three. Sex lives of college girls. Kimberly feels awkward that she's dating Leighton's brother, Nico, so she doesn't tell Leighton about it, which means that Leighton cannot inform her that Nico already has a girlfriend. Oh, no! Never have I ever. Davy wants to date both Ben and Paxton, so she lies and tries to to date both of them without telling the other. Love, Simon. Simon is closeted and emailing his secret internet boyfriend on a school computer, which leads to accidental discovery, which leads to blackmail, which leads to lies, which leads to meddling, which leads to hijinks. Love, Victor. Victor is afraid to come out as gay because he's dating a girl and doesn't want to hurt her feelings, and that drives the plot of the entire first season. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that these other shows are bad for choosing to do this. Miscommunication as conflict 
is a time-honored trope with a long and noble history. We were on a break! Okay. The problem only arises when the trope becomes overused enough to congeal and mutate into a dreaded cliché. YouTuber Passion of the Nerd even introduced a name for this particular cliché in his review of the Buffy the Vampire Slayer episode, Dead Man's Party, a plot of omission. I think there must be hundreds of episodes of television that wouldn't exist if in the first five minutes of the episode one character had just opened their frickin' pie hole and been honest. A lie is fine as an event in a plot, but when sins of omission become the plot entire, you've lost me. Passion of the Nerd is mostly talking about characters withholding information rather than actively lying, but the principle still stands. Also, you should go watch his stuff. He reviews Buffyverse properties with grace, panache, and thoughtfulness. The point is, there are so many high school romance shows built upon the foundation of miscommunication and the escalation thereof that such a plot can feel well-trod at best and tedious at worst. And so, the reason that Heartstopper feels so unique is not necessarily because of the tone it strikes, but rather because its story structure veers so hard in the opposite direction. Part 2, all aboard for de-escalation station! On all those other shows, characters often really want to communicate, but find it too difficult. On Heartstopper, they find it difficult, but do it anyway. For instance, in episode 1, it is established that Elle is feeling very lonely and has no friends at her new school, to the point that in episode 2, her teacher becomes kinda concerned about it. The endearingly observant teacher clocks that Elle is low-key kinda friend-crushing on two fellow students, Tara and Darcy. The teacher asks Elle, I could assign Tara Jones to look after you. Which Elle understandably rejects, because outsourcing your friend-making efforts to your goddamn teacher is the most cringe shit that has ever passed before my corneas. But despite this, a day or two later, Tara comes up and makes some pretty blatant friendly overtures. Do you want to meet up with us for lunch today? And though Tara denies that this was spurred by the teacher when Elle asks, uh, come on, come on, we know what happened. Did Miss Greenwood tell you to try and make friends with me? Uh, no. Look at that weak ass milk toast denial. Ms. What's her face absolutely put Tara up to this, but at the end of the day, can you really argue with the results? Elle becomes close friends with both Tara and Darcy, enough that she's one of the first people they come out to as a lesbian couple. I don't know. The older I get, the less patience I have for, like, elegant solutions to things. <laughs> if it gets the fucking job done, if it helps you ask out your crush, or kickstart that difficult conversation, or make friends when you're lonely in a brand new environment, who the fuck cares how cringe it is? I'll tell you who cares, teenagers, but kids, as you're YouTube dad, I'm telling you, you gotta curb stop that impulse right now. Cringe may be cringe, but cringe gets shit done. Point being, Elle's wallowing in isolation to avoid facing her understandable social anxiety head on is a form of internal dishonesty, as evidenced by this scene where she lies to Tao over text about how lonely she is. And though the means this kind teacher used to help her break out of it was less than graceful, it was also just kind of an honest acknowledgement of where Elle was at. And that shit's resolved in episode two, which seems really early, right? Wrong. Why? Don't worry about it, because we're gonna move on and I want to talk about Nick and Charlie, and, and you, you can't stop me. You can't stop me, mom! This show constantly subverts my expectations by just kinda having things be okay. <laughs> At every turn, when another show would choose to escalate a situation, Heartstopper de-escalates. In episode 5, Nick gets into a situation that isn't too dissimilar to Victor's during season 1 of Love, Victor. Imogen, a girl from Higgs who hangs out with his rugby friends, asks him on a date and he feels pressured to say yes. Later, he tries to call off the date, but then Imogen's dog just fucking dies and she's crying and he doesn't feel like he can add another shitty thing to her week. But then Nick gets invited to Charlie's birthday party at the same time. Oh no! He's overbooked himself. He has two dates to the dance. And to top it all off, at this point, Nick is dating Charlie in secret because he's pretty much only just realized he might not be straight and he isn't out to literally anyone yet. Miscommunication. Conflict. Complications. We're cooking with gas. 
gas, baby! So I want you to imagine that you're me, and you're watching this show for the first time after a steady diet of YA romance TV for the last two years or so, which is more like ten years in pandemical time. What at this point do you expect to happen? Well, obviously, Nick ghosts Imogen, ditching her for the birthday party. And Imogen, who in the past has been shown to be a bit of a problematic persona... I'm not, like, homophobic. I'm an ally. Congratulations. We thank you for your service. Well, obviously, she goes all psycho and tracks Nick down at the bowling alley. And, of course, she witnesses Nick and Charlie kissing, and she becomes infuriated. And she leaks the news to the whole school, and they have to reconcile with her later, and yeah, none of that shit happens. Instead, it's made clear that Charlie's birthday party at the bowling alley starts a little earlier in the day than Nick's date with Imogen. And Charlie and Nick have an honest, yet incredibly difficult conversation about the Imogen situation. And then, Nick texts Imogen. He cancels the date, but makes a plan to meet up with her tomorrow and explain the situation. And then he does that! He doesn't tell her that he's questioning his sexuality, because as of that moment, it's none of her business, but he is honest with her that he just doesn't like her in that way. He talks with her honestly about feeling disenchanted with his old friend group. And best of all, he brings his own dog to cheer her up after her dog's death! What a nice upstanding boy! Truly a mensch, I cannot handle it! So all of this is extremely wholesome, obviously, but is it conflict? Not really, right? It's de-escalation. And one would think, then, that it would not be compelling to watch, but the fact remains that it is. These eight episodes are packed with enough drama to keep me screaming and crying and yelling at the screen the entire time. It almost feels like the show is cheating. What is going on? I think that what Heartstopper understands about de-escalation is that being honest about who you are and what you feel, especially when you're queer, it's nerve-wracking. It's difficult. It's often met with considerable opposition from the world around you, which can make your life measurably worse. That is where the show conjures its conflict. Not in characters avoiding being honest, but through them powering through it despite the obstacles and facing the consequences head-on. That is the truly innovative thing here. Now, does this ethos occasionally make the characters seem a little too therapized? A tad more self-actualized than most teenagers usually are. Well, uh, perhaps. And there are certainly moments throughout Heartstopper where the relentlessly healthy reactions to things can become a little distracting. That doesn't sound very healthy. And does it feel good to have told someone? You should try rugby. It's good for releasing negative emotions. But frankly, if that's your reaction, I would ask you to consider how your expectations have been shaped by the myriad of other high school shows where miscommunication drives the plot. Teenagers can be honest and communicate. It's a skill that you can learn just like math or the clarinet. And frankly, one of the most viable ways to do that is shows like Heartstopper that model this kind of behavior. Teaching kids and teenagers this shit is so vitally important it's not even funny. Because if you don't, you get Ben, and you don't want to have Ben, do you? Part 3, Benny and Harry and Tao Su Oh My. The only people in Heartstopper who miscommunicate are the villains, and yes, I'm including Tao in that. Shut up, it's my video essay. In case you've tried your very hardest to forget who Ben is, and I don't blame you, Ben is the kid Charlie is hooking up with at the start of the season who treats Charlie like a fun, dirty little secret, and then attempts to assault him when Charlie tells him he's no longer interested. As Charlie explicitly states multiple times, the problem with Ben is not that he's closeted or too scared to come out. Coming out is hard, and no one should be shamed for feeling daunted by it. The problem is that he is so goddamn fearful of his own desire desires, that he will bully, lash out, and most importantly, miscommunicate in order to feel like he's in control of something. Ben spends his time lying to himself so constantly and so severely that he cruelly pushes his frustrations onto external punching bags, mostly Charlie, giving him deniability around the very existence of his turbulent inner struggle. And that shit is never resolved, at least not in season one. There are some people who will keep doing that until the day 
they die, and it is not your responsibility to try and fix them. Harry, meanwhile, oh boy, Harry, Harry, oh boy, Harry, oh boy, Harry. Harry is a bully, uh, and that's kind of it. That's kind of all the characterization we get, at least, again, in season one. It could even potentially be argued that he is a little bit one note, but he is so fun to hate, and I saw such verisimilitude in his bullying that I still found the presence of the character to be extremely meaningful. I'm a particular fan of the way Harry attempts to hide behind the curtain of jokes while, like, never actually making any jokes. He just says bigoted things very loudly and in an annoying tone of voice. You feel sorry for him because he's gay. Aww, are you gay for them? Maybe listen to your boyfriend. At least he knows his place. And when he inevitably receives pushback, he just couches it under the thin claim of it just being a joke. Someone really needs to learn to take a joke. You just can't seem to take a joke anymore. Like, you know I was only joking in the cinema, don't you? It's all just banter, isn't it? I mean, the lads can see his banter. You can see his banter. A common conservative punditry technique, certainly. This was locker room talk. But also just a common tactic for anyone who wants to be a dick without consequences. But it's just like, number one, none of these statements have the structure of a joke. There's no setup and no punchline. Take a goddamn comedy class, Harry. And secondly, even seeding the dubious notion that you are just joking, uh, you, you, you know the jokes are, like, real, right? J jokes happen. This line of thinking is a symptom of a much larger societal issue wherein we devalue and diminish the concept of humor to the point where we simply don't understand its essential social purpose. Humor is an important tool for bonding humans together as well as speaking truth to power. As such, humor can be a potent weapon for good and for ill, but because we go out of our way to misunderstand its application, bad actors can always hide the damage they cause while wielding this weapon behind the phrase, it's just a joke. Miscommunication isn't always always born of insecurity or fear like it is in all those other high school shows. Sometimes it's deliberate as a tactic to oppress others. Which brings us to Tao. Oh, oh Tao, oh my sweet baby boy Tao. Uh, it's funny, I can tell I'm getting older because I've started having very parental feelings towards any character who's younger than me. Like take this scene in episode 8 where Nick walks into the ocean so he can make a big romantic declaration, and it's supposed to be inspirational and heartwarming, but honestly, my first reaction to it was just like, young man, those shoes are gonna be so They're gonna get moldy and disgusting, you're gonna be uncomfortable for the rest of the day, and you're gonna get wet sand all over the mudroom, and I will not have it in my house. You take your shoes off before going into the ocean. This is like day one beach stuff. Okay, back to Tao. Uh, the problem with Tao is that he's straight. The problem with Tao is that he's a film bro. The problem with Tao is that his hair is just... it's just so stupid. <laughs> the problem with Tao is that he is terrified of abandonment. And while he certainly has a modicum of self-awareness about this... And now you're gonna tell me I'm just being jealous? Because you made a new friend and I'm scared of being alone. Yeah. Nothing is more important than my egomania. Right, you actually said that. I speak from experience when I say that you can have self-awareness fallen out your wazoo and still possess zero capability to actually stomp on the brakes and stop the behavior. And like many folks carrying this paradox inside them, Tao takes his anger out on the very people he worries are drifting away, turning a mere feeling into a self-fulfilling prophecy. Tao is overprotective of Charlie to the point of obsession. To the point that when he finds out that Nick has a crush on Charlie, he goes out of his way to dive deep into the grapevine in an attempt to locate gossip that will discredit Nick as a potential romantic prospect. Nick likes a girl. Like, he's in love with a girl. Her name's Tara Jones. Yeah, we learn later that this gossip is literally three years old. This gossip is old enough to be walking around on its own and forming full sentences. In addition, much of Tao's conflict throughout season one involves him clashing with Harry and the rest of the bullying rugby lads. He is constantly trying to curb the bullying against Charlie by just verbally insulting Harry, which just, like, Tao, Tao, that... <laughs> 
That doesn't work. The problem with bullies like that is not that no one ever stands up to them or dunks on them hard enough. The problem is that Harry engineers a no-lose situation for himself where he gets what he wants no matter how people react. If the victim pulls a Charlie, quietly enduring the bullying with no pushback, that reads as permission to keep doing it. If the victim pulls a Tau and fights back verbally, or even pulls a Nick and fights back physically, that's even more entertaining because it means he's gotten under your skin and now he has an outlet for even more aggression. You're not winning against Harry by pushing back, Tau, and I think that deep down you know that. Which makes me think that honestly you're not doing this for Charlie. You're doing this so you can assert control over something, anything, when it feels like you have none. And then you are able to hold this favor over Charlie's head when you feel he is drifting away from you. This manifests in an even uglier way when Charlie actually starts getting really closer with Nick. Because Nick hangs out with the rugby lads, in Tao's eyes he is immediately disqualified from full personhood. Never mind that Nick regularly stands up to Harry as well. Never mind that Nick makes several valiant overtures to be Tao's friend. Never mind that Nick has expressed to Charlie some genuine disillusionment with his old friend group, which he might be willing to express to Tao as well if he were given an opening. Now none of this is to say that Tao is entirely wrong to be wary of Nick. Nick even acknowledges this himself and is very understanding and chill about Tao's aggression towards him. But Tao is so unwilling to examine his valid trauma that it morphs into a kind of prejudice. And frankly, it's less damaging to Nick than it is to Charlie, the very person that Tao is ostensibly protecting. On top of everything else, it discourages Charlie from confiding in Tao about this new meaningful relationship. Why didn't you tell me about you and Nick? Charlie, don't answer that. I'll take this one. Tao, Tao, it, it's because you've been a dick about Nick this whole time. Now, why does Heartstopper frame Tao as redeemable while it does no such thing regarding the other two villainous characters of the show? Say it with me, communa fucking cation baby! In the final episode of the season, when Tao is at his lowest point, Nick sits at his picnic table and makes one final last-ditch attempt to honestly connect. And perhaps because none of his tactics have worked so far, or perhaps because he has friends, or let's be honest, mostly L, willing to challenge him and push him to be more empathetic, Tao is finally willing to listen. There's a universe where he isn't. Where, kind of like Nate in season two of Ted Lasso, he is too traumatized to accept a helping hand and pushes it away. But Tao avoids that fate by finally, finally, looking inward and realizing why exactly Charlie didn't want to tell him about Nick. And in doing so, he is able to give Nick some rock-solid advice. This is my favorite conversation in the entire season. It's a scene that in any other show would have me like yelling at the screen like, oh my god, yes, Jesus Christ, you should have just had this conversation five fucking episodes ago and we could have avoided all of this. But because this breakthrough is rooted in Tao's character growth and because he had the most growing to do out of any other character and because watching him grow was in equal measure viscerally satisfying and screamingly painful. It works. It's a lovely little moment of catharsis for us. And most importantly, it drives home the idea that healthy communication is just as much an internal process as it is an external one. Before this moment, it's not as if Tao had much trouble telling people what he really thought. But when the damage runs that deep, it's not enough to just plunge the toilet. You gotta fix the plumbing. Part four, what makes this jock different from all other jocks? So throughout the entirety of season one, Heartstopper draws a deliberate parallel between Nick and Ben. They are both closeted bisexual rugby boys who hook up with Charlie at different points, and they both ask Charlie not to tell anyone about the relationship. And when I say Heartstopper draws this parallel, I primarily mean that Nick draws the parallel. At school, is it okay if we like, Keep this a secret. Yeah. Nick is very aware of how Ben treated Charlie and the harm he inflicted. He even overheard the conversation in episode one where Ben equates his treatment of Charlie with his reticence to come out. Don't be angry at me for not wanting to come out yet. And though it's mostly nonverbal, you can tell that Nick is absolutely terrified that once he starts dating Charlie in secret, he's pulling the exact same shit. I told him. How about the Ben making me keep us a secret thing? 
It not, I mean, that's nothing like what we're doing. You're nothing like him. This is completely different. Oh, I look at Nick's sad little punim there. You can tell just by looking at him that Charlie's reassurance here is not entirely effective. Over the next several episodes, Nick clearly struggles with the guilt of what he's doing, even as Charlie refuses to enforce that guilt. So what's the answer? We, the audience, can feel that Nick is different from Ben, but nobody, not even Charlie, is quite able to articulate why. Well, there's an obvious answer that ties into my main point about honesty, but there's a second less obvious answer that honestly ties into a very important bit of queer praxis. The obvious answer is one that Charlie explicitly points out in season one. Don't be angry at me for not wanting to come out yet. I'm not angry about that. Then why are you angry at me? I'm angry because you never even slightly cared about my feelings. The secret was never the problem. It was Ben's treatment of him. But interestingly, I don't think that those two things are as separate as Charlie is treating them here. An essential part of Ben's dismal treatment of Charlie is his denial of the severity of the secret that they are keeping. Whenever Ben talks to Charlie about not telling anyone, he is frustratingly casual about it. Still don't tell anyone about this. Hi. Hi. Look at the framing there. We don't even see Ben say it. The camera stays on Charlie's face. It feels like an afterthought, 80 yard in after the fact, or a, a quick reminder shouted over Ben's shoulder on the way out of the room. All of the dialogue between the two of them in this first episode has this tone, with Charlie showing outward nervousness and confusion, and Ben playing everything so cool you'll get frostbite just looking at him. And in playing it so cool, we can infer subtextually how distressing uncool he actually feels. Just, hi. Why are you talking to me? I don't even know who you are. Ben, that's not how you react to a stranger who says hi to you in the hallway. The correct answer here is to go, hi? and then you just keep on trucking. This is the most this tweet response you could have possibly mustered. Throughout the season, Ben consistently and repeatedly downplays how much being in the closet bothers him. And the inverse of this is something that Nick intuits right away, but which Ben never quite figures out. Namely, dating someone who's in the closet has an intense social cost that the closeted person will never be able to fully mitigate while they are still closeted. That's the bottom line, folks. That's the harsh truth of the matter. And once again, I do not say it to shame anyone who is still in the closet for whatever reason. But at the end of the day, that is the reason that other queer people are going to be reticent to date you. Not to say that they won't, but they will take on some of that weight by doing so. Some people are very happy to do that, others are not, and you just gotta accept that. Which brings me back to Charlie and the singular relationship dysfunction between him and Nick that defines much of the back half of season one. Tao, ever incisive, observes a key fact about Charlie in my aforementioned favorite scene of all time. I've known Charlie since we were 11. And he's always had a tendency to believe that him just existing is annoying for other people. Yeah. I... I sort of got that impression. And we, the audience, have also noticed this. But the unspoken point here is that as a result of this tendency, Charlie is perhaps a little too eager to cover for Nick's closetedness to his own detriment. Now, to be clear, Charlie absolutely did the right thing by steadfastly refusing to out Nick to anyone before he was ready. Acting differently would have been a real asshole move. But in the same way that Ben refused to acknowledge the pressure Charlie was under during their affair, Charlie refuses to acknowledge what keeping Nick's secret is costing him. He punitively applies Ben's paradigm to himself in a way that Nick is absolutely not asking for. I'm really sorry for being all clingy and annoying. I'm making this so awkward. You want to keep us a secret and I'm messing it up. I'm the one who should be saying sorry. That is what makes this jock different from all other jocks. Perhaps because Olivia Coleman didn't raise no fool, and perhaps because one of his first interactions with Charlie was witnessing Ben's emotional abuse. Nick is keenly aware of the burden Charlie is shouldering, even when Charlie isn't. And that's what allows him not only to acknowledge that sacrifice, but to frame it as a beautiful gift that Charlie is giving him, rather than taking advantage of it as Ben might, or resenting the favor as Tao might. And as a 
allows him to act not in a spirit of transactional reciprocity, but in one of infinite mutual generosity. Nick didn't have to come out at the end of the season. It was always his personal decision. Charlie states multiple times that he never wants Nick to feel forced to be out, and Nick is always keen to respond that he is doing this for himself. But like, doing things for yourself and doing things for the people you love? need not be two separate acts. That's kinda what, you know, love is about. Fuck, I'm getting emotional. Nick is doing this for himself, and part of doing something nice for himself is doing something that will make Charlie happy. And that's gorgeous. It's a thing we just don't often see in a rom-com, queer or otherwise. And it's just, it's nice. It's beautiful. What, what do you want me to say? I fucking, I, I liked it. I liked it, I cried a lot. And it's funny because, of course, none of this is to say that Nick and Charlie are like the most functional people ever, or that they will never have problems again. Charlie is defo gonna have to work on his self-esteem a bit, and Nick is still kinda in the middle of figuring out how to distance himself from his old group of friends, which, actually, can we sidebar about this for a second? Because I love this subplot, which entirely consists of Nick realizing that his group of friends kinda sucks. Because television is saved and damned on the axis of the found family trope, I feel like realizing that you're in a toxic friend group is just something we don't ever see on screen. Despite that being a very relevant struggle, especially when you're a teenager! And I love that even after he realizes he wants out, we still see him hanging out with them out of habit. Friend groups, especially at school, often define your daily routine so much that extricating yourself from one can be a lengthy and complicated process, especially because we don't have a social mechanic for it the way we do for romantic relationships. As a final side note, I knew nothing about rugby going into Heartstopper, and now I feel like I know even less. Is it seriously just all the bone-cracking, brain-liquefying fun of American football, just like without the 50 pounds of protective equipment? About the tackling, you've really got to commit to it, okay? Try not to worry about getting hurt, and just throw yourself into it. That's an insane thing to tell a child, coach. Are you okay? Is, is England okay? Are you guys okay over there? Part 5, a footnote about porn. To close out the show today, I would like to discuss a common criticism that I have heard bandied toward Heartstopper a distressing number of times. Namely, why don't these kids fall? So there's a scene where Nick goes online, going online, I know what's coming, <laughs> and instead he goes, am I gay? To me, that jumped the line. That jumps right past all the fun bits about being queer so he can go looking for a label. Labels come later, if they come at all. What he would be figuring out in that moment is what he's attracted to. And I have it on very good authority. I haven't checked this out myself. But I am told that the internet has one or two websites where you could go <laughs> to get some help figuring that kind of stuff out. Also, you're telling me he Googled am I gay before he Googled gay porn? Please. Please, honey. And, like, sure, point taken, a modern teenager discovering his queer sexuality for the first time would most likely include some internet porn in his research deep dive. And for a show that is primarily about romance and attraction amongst teens, Heartstopper is remarkably non-sexual. But, like, I hard disagree that this is somehow a drawback or unrealistic or a plot hole. There are two reasons for this aspect of the show. The first one is a somewhat self-explanatory out-of-universe one. Namely, this show is marketing itself towards younger audiences. Heartstopper is trying to speak directly to teenagers and young children in order to spark conversations about positive queer representation. And one simply cannot market oneself to that demographic if you got a bunch of sucking and fucking going on. And like we've all seen Euphoria. We're all over it. The second reason, the in-universe reason, has to do with perspective. Heartstopper has a great deal of respect for its characters and their privacy. This is, of course, not a wonderful and virtuous thing in and of itself. I mean, can you imagine if the writers of It's Always Sunny respected its characters and their privacy? Andrew, you got any bacon bits? We like to put them in Artemis's hair, and they rain down on me when we bang. I feel like a Cobb salad. It just largely depends on the type of story you're trying to tell. And this story specifically is trying to model healthy behavior for all of the reasons we've just covered. In order to achieve that, we the audience have to both love and respect the characters. And in order to achieve that, 
the show has to too. Just as Nick and Charlie behave in respectful ways in their relationship, acknowledging each other's boundaries, emotions, and struggles, Heartstopper itself crosses few lines with its characters that the characters wouldn't cross with each other. And so we simply aren't shown the porn, which like, yeah, in all probability, in all likelihood, absolutely definitely happen. Because yes, these characters have sexual thoughts and desires, of course they do. Look at Charlie's little glance downward when Nick takes off his sweater in this scene and briefly exposes a bit of midriff. I mean, come on. Talk about a nonverbal moment that I related to harder than possibly I've ever related to anything. Wow, being a teenager is terrible. You fucking said it, Mr. Ajayi. Here, fucking here. Fiction is, by its very nature, inherently voyeuristic, and there's nothing wrong about that on the surface. But at its worst, that voyeurism can convince fandoms that, for instance, we are entitled to the intimate knowledge of an 18-year-old actor's sexual orientation just because we went on a similar journey with a character that he played. I agree entirely with Kit Connor's assertion that fans who engaged in this harassment, aside from, you know, just committing a very dickish act in and of itself, have fundamentally misunderstood the point of the show. And so I have a soft spot for stories that take a moment to give their characters a much needed moment of privacy, even when it's not called attention to, like this. It makes the audience character relationship feel grounded and real. It forces us to treat the fictional character, however briefly, as we would a real-life friend. I am reminded of an excerpt from a series of unfortunate events, a children's book series by Lemony Snicket, who is at once a pen name for the real-life author Daniel Handler, and kind of a character in his own right. The series is framed as though Mr. Snicket is a journalist writing a non-fiction history of our protagonists, the Baudelaire siblings. And in Book 10, The Slippery Slope, in a moment where it's heavily implied that Violet Baudelaire shares a kiss with another character, we get this. Many things have been taken from the three Baudelaires. Their parents were taken, of course, and their home was taken from them by a terrible fire. But one thing that was taken from the Baudelaires that is not often discussed is their privacy, a word which here means time by oneself, without anyone watching or interfering. So, as Violet and Quigley rest for a few minutes more on a ledge halfway up the frozen waterfall, I will take this opportunity to give them a bit of privacy by not writing down anything more of what happened between those two friends on that chilly afternoon. Certainly, there are aspects of my own personal life that I will never write down, however precious they are to me. And I will offer the eldest Baudelaire the same courtesy. I will tell you that the two young people resumed their climb, and that the afternoon slowly turned to evening, and that both Violet and Quigley had secret small smiles upon their faces. But there has been so little privacy in the life of Violet Baudelaire that I will allow her to keep a few important moments to herself, rather than sharing them with my distressed and weeping readers. For another perspective, take this excerpt that I love from an Avatar The Last Airbender fanfic of all places. Take a long look, because this is the last of Sokka's thoughts we will be privy to today. We take a step back as Katara takes a step forward, then another, then another, until the wide and wind-swept clifftop fills our view, two blue-clad figures at the center of it. Some things are not necessary to witness. We are guests in their story, after all. We take off our shoes out of respect, we sit with them as friends, but we do not overstay our welcome. The figures, small against the grassy expanse and smaller still in comparison to the distant trees, come together. Their hug lasts an age, or perhaps we have immortalized it, the way the great swordsmen do, holding the lay of the land as a painting in our minds. The sun melts into the horizon, it all goes dark for us. We will see them again tomorrow. And indeed we will see them again tomorrow because it took me like a fucking year to make this video after season one came out and season two is coming out like, I don't know, fucking tomorrow, a week from, the, I don't know. Just fucking get off my back, okay? My back is very fragile and my chiropractor will have your fucking head.